So I am president of OCD Massachusetts. I'm also president of the International OCD Foundation. I helped to open up the OCD Institute in 1997 and worked there for 10 years. Um, I worked with Jenny Bean and Diane for a long, long time, probably 20 years. And I also um, am on the Cape Cod Morning Task Force Steering Committee and um, clinical director of the newly opened um, Cape and Islands Cognitive Behavioral Institute. And also I've been treating people with OCD for a lot of years, probably 15, 20 years. So it's all OCD all the time. So, <laughs> so I, tonight I'm going to talk about uh, new directions in the assessment and treatment of OCD. Some things you guys may already know about. Some things you might, you guys might be hearing about for the first time. And really, this um, talk is not really designed to go into any one of these things majorly in depth. It's really just to notify you guys about what's happening in the field and hopefully give you guys information to bring back to your treaters to inquire and learn more about it to see whether or not it would benefit from this adjunct to your current treatment that you are currently in treatment. Um, you'll also, some of the things that we're talking about are actually going to be, we're actually going to go over later in the lecture series. Um, and I'll highlight that for you if I'm talking about something that someone's going to talk about in later months. I'll let you know um, because I will not be doing it justice here, but other speakers will probably go into that in greater detail. Okay. So um, one of the first things that we're going to talk about is diagnostic criteria for OCD. Have you guys all heard about the DSM? Okay, so that's the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual. And it's the manual that clinicians use to help diagnose the people that we treat. Okay, and uh, every 15 or 20 years, the APA puts out a new version. And the fifth edition has just recently been adopted. Many controversial things have happened, but for OCD, I think good things have happened. Okay. Um, one of the first things is that OCD has been pulled out from under anxiety disorders and now has its own category, okay? which we think is good news for some very pragmatic reasons. Um, first of all, we think that OCD and related disorders being its own separate category will probably free up more money for OCD education, OCD treatment, and OCD research. There's very little money out there, research money out there. And we think sort of highlighting in a separate category will be helpful. Uh, we also think that it will improve the validity of diagnosis. Okay. Another cool thing is that hoarding and skin picking are now separate disorders and conditions instead of OCD symptoms or subtypes. Um, and they're now under this category. So before, hoarding was an OCD symptom. And before, skin picking was never even mentioned, really as anything in other previous versions of the DSM, but for anyone who suffers from it or anyone who treats it, it is a real problem. Okay, so now they are separate disorders, conditions, and they're under this category. Um, BDD, body dysmorphic disorder, has been pulled from somatoform disorder and put under <coughs> this category. So it's much more related to OCD than it is to like hypochondriasis or anything like that. Um, trichotillomania, which I haven't confirmed, I meant to confirm, but I think it may have been renamed. We were hoping to get it renamed to hair pulling disorder instead of trichotillomania. I just, I just don't know if that actually happened. I think it probably has. But anyway, we wanted it renamed because trichotillomania, like what does that actually even mean? Um, sometimes people feel like mania, bipolar, it has nothing to do with that. Hair pulling is exactly what it is. We felt like renaming that would be helpful to people in understanding and also reduce stigma. Um, and also, um, it was listed under impulse control disorder, which basically had compulsive gambling, pyromania, okay, hair pulling is much more, it's much better under this category. So, um, those are some of the ways in which OCD has changed in this new DSM. So, we're happy about it for the most part. We're also very happy because at one time they were floating the idea of putting OCD under impulse control disorders, which would have been a complete disaster because um, insurance companies really don't reimburse for impulse control disorders, or it's really hard to get reimbursed treatment under impulse control disorders. So we're happy with where it is. So I'm giving this talk because um, first line treatments for OCD are ERP, exposure and response prevention, and SSRI medications. Okay, And um, as I'll talk about in a minute, um, many people do benefit from first line treatments for OCD but many people do not. And so those of us that are working and researching um, in this particular area need to think beyond first-line treatment. So we need to help the people who are not benefiting. So 
Um, how effective are first-line treatments for OCD? Well, most studies show that on average about 70% of patients with OCD will benefit from first-line treatments. And the patients who do respond often respond significantly, uh, 50 to 80% reduction in OCD symptoms. Um, however, medications need to be taken on a regular basis to be effective. And many times people have to stop because of side effects. Or many times people will, medication will just stop working. Or many times people will take themselves off medication and put themselves back on and not actually have the effect that they initially had. Okay? Um, and for ERP, you have to really engage in it. You have to really work at this extremely difficult treatment in order for it to be effective. So, unfortunately, studies show that at least 25% of OCD patients refuse behavior therapy, and as many as half of OCD people continue medication, discontinue medications due to side effects or for other reasons. Okay, and so it's for those reasons that we really need to think beyond first-line treatments, beyond ERP, beyond SSRI. Okay. So, in terms of psychotherapy, where do we go from ERP? Okay, one new thing that we're talking about is ACT, Acceptance and Commitment Therapy. Is there anybody in this room who's not heard of Acceptance and Commitment Therapy before? Okay, okay. So I'll go through it. Um, I want to let you know that we will have an entire lecture coming up on Acceptance and Commitment Therapy. Nate Gruner, who is an ACT guru, who works over at the OCD Institute um, will be here talking about it. So if I leave you more confused, <laughs> come come to one of the um, future lectures and he'll he'll help you get things clarified. Um, but basically, ACT is sort of considered. See, in, in cognitive behavioral therapy, there's three waves. Okay, the first wave was operant conditioning. The second wave was the addition of cognitions as something we need to pay attention to. The whole Aaron Beck thing. The third wave is more of a mindfulness-based CBT approach, okay, and this is where ACT is coming from. It was developed by Stephen Hayes and his colleagues. And in a nutshell, I'll go through my slides, but in a nutshell, basically what Hayes is saying is that the human condition is tough. We experience negative thoughts, feelings, and bodily sensations. Very unpleasant, right? Who likes that? And we tend to think that if we are having these negative thoughts or feelings or bodily sensations, that we are broken, we are defective, we are disordered. And if you think that way about yourself when you're having negative thoughts, feelings, and bodily sensations, are you going to embrace these things or are you going to try to push them away? You're going to try to push them away. So people try to suppress negative thoughts, feelings, and bodily sensations. They try to control them, and Hayes believes that we suffer a major psychological impact because of that. Clear so far? Okay. So basically what Hayes wants to do is he wants to teach us, he wants us to clarify our values. Okay? If I say, what's your value system? It's actually kind of hard to answer that. Um, so he wants to clarify what our values are, and he wants us to make decisions about the life that we want to live based on our values and not on what will make us feel better emotionally. Okay? If we make decisions based on what makes us feel better emotionally, we end up running around like a dog chasing its tail. There's really no direction there. We cannot control our thoughts and feelings. They come. They are painful. And if we try to control them, we're making decisions about what makes us feel better in the moment, which is often in direct competition to the kind of thing that we should be doing to help us move our life forward, to help us live the kind of life we want to have. Okay? That's good. Clear? Okay, so that is acceptance and commitment therapy. It's, it actually, would, I, I encourage everybody to come and listen to Nate because it, it's something that um, you can apply to all parts of your life, not just OCD. You can use it if you have, if you're just a human being. I use it in my life every day. Okay, so basically, um, we need to accept what is out of our personal control, our negative thoughts and feelings, and commit to action that improves and enriches our life. So the aim of ACT is to maximize human potential for a rich, full, and meaningful life. ACT does this by teaching psychological skills to deal with painful thoughts and feelings effectively in such a way that they have less impact and influence over us. They're called mindfulness skills. ACT helps us to clarify what is truly important and meaningful to us, our values, and then we use that knowledge to guide, inspire, and motivate us to change our lives for the better. 
Okay? So, everybody clear on that? Okay, I'm not going to go through a lot of these things because it just makes us a little bit crazy, but I'll, I'll illustrate the difference. So, so um, most people think the A. The inability to control or eliminate negative internal experiences is a sign of weakness. ACT wants us to believe. Trying to control a negative internal experience creates problems. Cre trying to control negative thoughts and feelings actually creates problems. Okay? Most people believe the appearance of negative internal experiences is a sign of personal problems. ACT wants us to believe. The appearance of negative internal experiences is an inevitable part of being alive. So this is just what it's like to be human. Okay? Instead of trying to control it, we should accept it and tolerate it and make decisions about how we're going to live our lives based on values. Okay? So, right now there's not a lot of research sort of um, using ACT against ERP. But a lot of us are using ACT with ERP. It's really, it's very helpful. ERP is very difficult. And if we can treat, if we can train people or help people to understand that part of what we experience is very scary in ERP, is just a part of what we have to go through to get better, and we'll make decisions to engage in ERP because that helps us to have the life that we want to have, versus avoiding ERP because it's too scary, we see that people really do get better. It helps people to accept the painful part of going through ERP. Okay, instead of avoiding. A lot of times when people are doing ERPs, they've been doing ERPs with people for almost 20 years, people are really trying to avoid. Distract, avoid, not feel, but that really is not the treatment and that really does inhibit people from getting as much benefit out of ERP as possible. If people have been trained in ACT and understand that you embrace negative and difficult things, they will be more likely to allow themselves to feel as badly as they need to feel, as scared and anxious as they need to feel in ERP, that they need to, to actually get benefit out of ERP because they understand that that is helping them have the life that they want to have. They don't want to have OCD anymore. Okay? So anyway, um, that's what ACT is doing. And there is some early outcome um, data is looking promising. So there's comparable drops in Y-box scores as seen in ERP. There's low dropout and treatment refusal rates. 12% versus 25% reported with ERP. But there's still limited research and we need to do more of that. Um, and they are doing that over at the OCD Institute right now, which is really cool. Okay? So that's one way in which we're thinking beyond ERP. Any questions about that before I move on to the next way in which we're thinking beyond ERP? Okay, so the next way is uh, we're really increasing the emphasis of family involvement in treatment. Traditional ERP is just you and your therapist or you and your coach. Okay, but really <laughs> what we need to do is broaden out that, okay, and sort of say what role does family have if you're living with family or significant others, either if you, if, even if you're not living with them and you just have people who care about you in your life, oftentimes there are family dynamics or relationship dynamics that really are keeping OCD around, okay? So what we want to do is we're looking at how family dynamics have been affected by the OCD, what family accommodating behaviors are actually happening, why accommodating behaviors don't work and what to do instead. Okay, so we need to make an assessment in the family and then we shouldn't just tell people what they're doing wrong. We also have to help them figure out what to do better, what to do differently. Okay, so this is sort of long, but I'm going to read it anyway because I think it really does illustrate how OCD affects the family, impacts the family functioning, and then we'll have a better context for having this conversation, okay? So this was written by a patient's mother and it was taken out of an intake packet from the OCD Institute, okay? So I'm gonna read it. So to get John to school, I have to get him out the door to school. This impacts greatly on my ability to get to work. School clothes are contaminated and only worn to school. They stay in the basement and I have to bring up a school outfit just in time for John to get dressed. These school clothes are placed in the back of a kitchen chair so John can pick up the clothes and put them on in the following order. Undershirt, shirt, jeans. Immediately after setting school clothes on the table, I must wash my hands with liquid Dove soap body wash under John's supervision. If he doesn't see me wash, he gets hysterical and manipulates me into washing again. John won't go in the basement to get his own school clothes because the basement is contaminated with school contamination. Also, school clothes are not allowed anywhere but the basement. Because the basement is an issue, he doesn't do laundry, get pantry items, proper goods, paper goods, etc. 
School clothes are washed, dried, and hung with non-school clothes. John is aware of this, but doesn't want to be reminded of it. School clothes are differentiated by brand for jeans and three-colored polo type shirts. In the winter, no matter how cold, John will not wear a coat as he doesn't want to get contaminated. Once John is ready for school, after much delaying, yelling, swearing, and checking, he will not touch anything in the house and no one can touch him. He walks through the front door, puts on his school shoes, and gets his school stuff, which he leaves by the front door. If he has a school paper that needs to be signed, I have to sign it using a school pen on John's back, a safe writing surface. I must then wash my hands again with liquid dove body wash under John's supervision. If I don't wash after touching school stuff, he starts screaming and yelling. He is also threatened not to go to school and is threatened to harm me. Once he goes out the door at approximately 8 a.m., I can then leave for work. If I wasn't here to get John up and ready for school, he would not go to school. I'm not allowed, however, at school. If John misses the bus, only his grandfather can take him in the green contaminated car. He will not get my car at all with school clothes on. If his grandfather is unavailable, John misses the entire day of school. In addition, John does his homework on the bus as he will not bring any books or papers from school into the house. Before John gets home from school, the bathroom has to be set up. The shower curtain has to be open, saran wrap over the shower, control knob, nine ounces of liquid dove body wash on the ledge, toilet seat up, bath rug in front of the sink and tub, and his flip flops have to be in the bathroom. John will come home from school and strip off all clothes outside the bathroom, leaving the contaminated clothes in the hallway. He then proceeds to use the toilet and get into the shower. John won't turn the on the light fan or flush the toilet and uses an entire roll of toilet paper a day. He then has some ritual with soap, washing water, and singing, which lasts about 70 minutes at present, until the hot water runs out. If I interrupt him in the shower, he has to start the whole ritual over. He has started having panic attacks in the shower recently. He is in agony. He doesn't want to shower as it is exhausting, but he doesn't feel like he can skip it. So John is tortured. Okay, John's not doing it to be a jerk. John is tortured. But so is John's mother. Right? And can you see? So if this person came to my office 45 minutes a week, once a week, and I was just working with him outside of the family environment, did not involve this family at all, are we going to make any progress here? It's going to be slow. Right? It's going to be really, really slow. So for many people, again, we're talking about people who do not benefit from just basic ERP and SSRIs. We're talking about everybody else, okay? So you can see here what, where the family would benefit from some help and assistance and guidance about what to do, but you can also see where John would too, okay? I also want to make a plug for ACT at this moment, okay? Because John's mother, in many ways, is being guided by what makes her feel less bad in the moment and not necessarily guided by the kind of thing that's actually going to help John get better or her and John have the life they want to have. So you can also use act for family stuff. Okay? So family accommodating behaviors. We can see how John's mother participates in behaviors, how she assists in the avoidance behavior, how she facilitates symptomatic behavior, how she modifies her family routine, how she takes out extra responsibilities, how leisure activities may be modified, and how the symptoms could be interfering with her own work functioning. Okay, so those are family accommodating behaviors, and we need to have this poor mother come in who just wants her son to be better and feel better. We need to come in and show her, see all of the ways in which you are participating in OCD. Okay? Um, we want, once we can identify what those family accommodating behaviors are, we can really emphasize to the family <coughs> why family accommodation behaviors don't work. They don't work, okay? They don't work because it prevents the person with OCD from learning new information. They don't work because usually, can you picture John's mother? I mean, is she doing a lot of these things with resentment, hostility, and criticism? I bet. She probably burnt out completely. Is that helping John? That's not helping John. The accommodating, um, accommodating the family member might be with the intention to keep the peace in the family or to alleviate one's own guilt and anxiety. However, the solution is short-lived as the anxiety returns and the need to accommodate arises again. So this is something that happens time and time and time and time again every morning, and it happens every morning. Okay, so it is not helping. Okay, and people with OCD report that the accommodating, accommodating behaviors are usually not all that helpful anyway. Okay, John, I can picture John's anxiety rising as his mother's involved. I can also picture John's mother's anxiety and affect rising as she's involved, which only just makes everything worse. Okay, so we really need to help people figure out how are you accommodating, and we need to really get people to understand this is not working. We need a new way. It's 
So we have to tell people what is the new way. So you don't just say, this is what you're doing wrong and you can't do it. We have to help people figure out what to do. So we have to teach people how to be supportive and encouraging and using and supportive and encouraging statements without doing something for them. Okay, so instead of doing whatever John wants, the mom needs to be able to say, and this is in the context of lots of support and a whole treatment, this one statement's not a panacea and gonna make everything better. Okay, but John's mother needs to be able to say, I know that you are struggling right now, I know that OCD is taking over right now, and you really want me to do these things, but I can't. Because it doesn't help you, it doesn't help your OCD, it doesn't help our relationship, so I love you, I care about you, I'm gonna support you right now, but I'm not gonna do this. You would never spring this on John when he's trying to get ready to for school in the morning. Obviously, this happens out of the anxiety moment. You also want to make sure you direct your anger and frustration at the illness rather than the person. What we find in families like this is there's high, high expressed emotion, lots of lots of affect in the house. So you want to make sure that um, if you're you're not saying you're you know you're awful or you ruin everything or why do you do this to me in the morning, you want to be able to say it's so hard to live with OCD. You know, OCD just takes over everything. It's so frustrating. You must be so frustrated, too. Um, you want to, this is what I was talking about, yeah. You want to teach the person, the parent, or the loved one how to practice tolerating their own feelings in response to the family member's distress, okay? So you want to inhibit the impulse on your part to act in a way that reduces their uncomfortable feeling state as a way to decrease your own uncomfortable feeling state. Does that make sense? Okay, so you need to know what you're thinking and feeling, and you need to manage what you're thinking and feeling so you can better help the person who's struggling in the moment. Okay, I don't want anything bad to happen. I don't want him to flip out and hurt me. So I'm just going to do this so that I don't have to feel worried about whether or not he's going to do anything. Okay, what you need to say is, okay, I'm really worried something bad is going to happen right now, but we did talk about this in family therapy. We did talk about this with Denise. I'm going to put this into action. I'm going to be consistent, and I'm going to trust that this is going to work. Okay? And remember that more involvement with your family member isn't always better. I always say that to family members. More is not better. Get out of their space. Get out of their face. Let them be. Let them follow their plan. It's okay if they're struggling. I have worked with one kid right now who really struggles with taking his medication without checking. And so if he takes his meds without checking, he is depressed. He's doing his response prevention. And his mother wants to rush in there. Are you okay? Are you okay? Is everything okay? But that just makes things worse. So like, just give him some space. Let him stay in that room. He'll be out in a couple minutes. Leave him alone. But in order for her to leave him alone and actually let him engage in the therapy, she's got to manage her own feelings about what's going on in that bedroom. Right? Okay. Okay. Anyway, more of the same. But you really want to make agreements. Like, this is, Mom, you know, it's not helpful when you want <coughs> to make sure I'm okay when I'm taking the medication. Well, you know, what would be helpful? It's more helpful when you just leave me alone. If it's hard for you, go outside and do your garden. Go take the dog for a walk. When, it, when you come back and I'm out of the room, ask me how I'm doing then. Okay, so you make these agreements. Okay, obviously limit reassurance seeking. Doesn't work. Um, give praise for small gains. I work here with this one kid, and for in one year he was really debilitated, really debilitated. In one year he's made a lot of gains, but it's certainly not what his family wants in terms of no OCD anymore. And I really have to coach the family on, like, are you serious? Like, he's doing A, B, C, D, and E. We need to recognize him for these gains. I don't think they're small, but if, even if she thinks they're small, these are important. If you cannot recognize small gains, then the person who's working on this is not going to be motivated. They're not going to be hopeful. They're not going to be able to maintain what they need to maintain um, in order to get this done. And again, I'm reminding you that this is about people who are not benefiting from first-line treatments. SSRIs and ERP. These are for people who um, symptoms are more severe and they need more help. Okay? So, ACT is a way that we're thinking beyond the ERP. Increasing family involvement is a way that we're thinking beyond the ERP. Another way that we're thinking beyond ERP is increased level of care. Okay, I do home based behavioral therapy for people with OCD. I do not do office based therapy. You want to know what? I don't think it works all that well. I've never done an office-based therapy, OCD therapy session. Um, but also, I'm working with people who don't benefit from that. So I'm working, I consider it a different level of care. I go into people's homes, I do the ERPs with them, I meet with the family, and sometimes I go more than one time a week and longer for one hour. Okay, so that's, that's an increased level of care. There are also 30 intensive treatment programs for OCD all around the country. Plain Hospital OCD Institute is one of them. 
Rogers Memorial Hospital is another. There are day treatment programs, there are residential treatment programs, there are intensive outpatient programs, there's home-based therapy. Okay? So for people who do not benefit in one time a week, 45 minute session in their therapist's office, <coughs> we're thinking beyond that with increased level of care. Um, one other thing um, that I learned about at the last conference, actually, um, was something called attention, tra attention training. Okay? And basically, we're trying to help, people with OCD are in their minds all the time, right? We call that self-focused attention. So self-focused attention is paying attention to your thoughts, intrusive thoughts, images, and emotions. You're in your head, you're in your head. No good happens there. And attention training is actually helping people get more externally focused. Okay, and so this was developed by British researcher Adrian Wells and successfully used with social phobia. We're now using it with OCD. Okay, so basically, like I said, the strategy is to shift attention externally, and that helps an individual disconfirm beliefs, be less anxious, and it interferes with the obsessions and compulsive rituals. Um, one exercise involves placing repetitive sound sources at similar sound levels at four corners of a room. So you might have a fan over here, a TV set to static over there, a radio over there, something else over there. And the individual focuses their vision on a spot right in front of them and shifts their hearing from one sound to another in a randomized way, gradually increasing the speed of the shifts from one sound to the next. And this technique is similar to meditation in that it strengthens the individual's ability to selectively focus attention, but it also seems to cool down the obsession, obsessional part of the brain by heating up competing areas. My practice, okay? Gets you out of your head, into the world around you. That is really beneficial for people with OCD. Again, I'm, um, I don't think I would treat someone with OCD with just attentional retraining, but for people who need more than ERP, I'm definitely using ACT. I'm definitely involving the family. Sometimes they go to increased level of care. I guess if they're with me, they are home-based. And I'll use attentional training. I'm, I'm using it all. Okay? And remember, this is not necessarily intended to answer all your questions about attentional training, but it is intended to help you understand enough to go talk to your current treater to see whether or not they, can, they think it's appropriate for your care or they can explain it in greater detail. We do not have a lecture on this coming up, but I will in the next lecture series. Okay? One other way that we're thinking beyond traditional ERP is through technological self-help. Apps. Apps for your iPhone. Okay? Um, some of you may have been here at a lecture earlier this year, Kristen Mulcahy, Dr. Kristen Mulcahy, developed the first app for OCD called Live OCD Free, and she gave a presentation on it, on what is OCD and then the app. And I have to tell you, I was extremely skeptical at first, I really, really was. But when I saw it in action, I was impressed. It really is a very cool tool. Um, I think that for people who are in treatment, they can use it to help them with their homework. I think for people who don't have access to treatment, can actually use this. People in different countries have been using it. A lot of people in India have been using it. Um, really helpful. So anyway, she calls it an interactive application <coughs> designed to guide users through ERP by helping the user develop a hierarchy, set practice goals and rewards, and it provides tools to help fight OCD. There's one version for adults and there's one for kids. It's available for the iPhone only. A Droid version is coming out. It costs approximately $80. And um, the people who treat OCD, the big wigs people who treat OCD, are actually impressed by this too and are using it in their treatment programs. The McLean Hospital OCD Institute, Rogers Memorial, Biobehavioral New York. They're doing outcome research with it. It's the real deal. Um, and like I said, Dr. Kristen will take that. Um, there's another app that was developed by Dr. Stephen Whiteside and Jonathan Abramowitz. Um, it's called the Mayo Clinic Anxiety Coach. It's a scale, it's not just for OCD, it's for anxiety. It's five bucks. <laughs> it's, it's a scaled down version. Um, it's, Kristen's is much more in depth and it's guiding, it's, it's, it's pretty sophisticated. This isn't quite so sophisticated, but um, it might be worth a try for people. Um, you take a test to rate the severity of your anxiety. You make a personal plan to target your worries. They have a library of about 500 activities that other people have found helpful when they're trying to manage their anxiety. You can pick from them to help you develop your plan. You track your anxiety and record your progress. Okay? So that's just another cool way that it's 
is the previous woman's uh, act or yeah. similar to the to be Bear's beta step? Oh, um, what's it called? BT steps. BT steps. Yeah, BT steps. Um, BT steps is online. It's not necessarily an app, but I think it's similar. I think BT steps has been around for a long time, but never really got the attention I think it deserved. But I think it's going to start to come back into people's purview. I didn't put it that way. Okay. Um, <clears throat> so we talked about next steps for um, diagnosing OCD with the DSM. We talked about next steps in psychotherapy. So we talked about ACT. We talked about family involvement. We talked about increased level of care. We talked about intentional retraining. We talked about apps. Now we're going to talk about um, the next steps for medication. I am not an MD. <laughs> so I will not be able to answer any brain questions. Um, but again, if you are and you're getting meds and you have a psychiatrist and um, you feel like your meds aren't working as well as you'd like them to, these are just some things for you to bring up to your doctor to see whether or not what their opinion is and whether or not they think it would be helpful for you. Okay? So the first one is dopamine. So um, dopamine targeted medications added to an SSRI have been shown to be helpful to some patients. So these are antipsychotics. We don't really like to say antipsychotics because people run away. But we use them at a much lower level as an augmenter. And I treat many people that are using these meds as an augmenter. And they've been helpful. Okay. Um, glutamate. So recent findings have shown elevated levels of the neurotransmitter glutamate in brains of those diagnosed with OCD compared to controls. Okay? I don't think that there's been any real formal research looking at glutamate for people with OCD, but I know that there are many, like Jenneke and other doctors around the country that treat lots of people with OCD who are really just trying out new things, have done this. We did it at the OCD Institute. We actually published some research on it. Um, Jenneke, if someone was at the OCD Institute and really struggling, and he was hoping for helping them more with medication, and they failed the SSRIs, he was putting them on, he used the med a lot. And so what we did is, when we decided that, oh, we should look at this and see whether or not anything's really happening, we went and did a chart review on all the people that were on the MENDA. We looked at their Y-box scores and sort of, you know, looked at it as compared to what their dosage, when they started the MENDA and their dosage, as they increased their dosages with the MENDA, their Y-box scores went down. We did find some significant results. We did publish a whole. So there's something there, but obviously there needs to be a lot more research. So if someone's really struggling, it might be worse. And, and, and I think it's... I think there are almost like no side effects. I didn't really feel anybody having any side effects. Um, D-cycloserin. Has anyone heard of D-cycloserin? Um, <clears throat> it's used a lot with people with PTSD. The treatment, the CBT treatment for PTSD is exposure therapy. Okay, so they are using this a lot with vets. So, um, so what we found, taking prior to ERP, it might enhance the ERP effect, at least in the early sessions. <clears throat> it also might help with ERP treatment compliance. Um, the drug does not directly treat symptoms, but it does promote neuroplasticity. Okay, so basically in parentheses I explain that. Makes brain circuits better able to remodel themselves in the context of experience. So basically what we're trying to do through ERP is train, change the brain, right? And we think that a decycloserin might facilitate that, might help that actually occur. Okay, um, those are the next steps in the feds. A lot of this, um, so also, you know, something that people have done in neurosurgery, does anybody know, anybody here has had neurosurgery? Okay. Well, some of these um, neurosurgical procedures have been around for a long time, but the one that I think is really cool is deep brain stimulation. And it's basically like a pacemaker for your brain. And it's recently been FDA approved for people with OCD. It's just prohibitively expensive. Um, but um, it has already been FDA approved, it's FDA approved for Parkinson's and a couple of other things. Um, but I am treating somebody who had deep brain stimulation through research um, study project with Darren Doherty. And while it did not take away the person's OCD symptoms, it dramatically unlocked this person. This person was very incapacitated, like couldn't talk, couldn't move. You know, which is like so much OCD. And um, what we found about a year ago, and he was in the research project, and they turned it on, and it was crazy. It was it was really cool. It was kind of scary for him because he didn't really know what was going on. But it did unlock him in a way that actually made treatment possible. Because when he was so locked down from his OCD symptoms, treatment wasn't possible. He couldn't really communicate with him. He couldn't really communicate with you. 
So it, it opened up things in a way that actually made it possible, and he is making gains, slow but sure gains. So I want to talk about that. Um, that again, like I said, I think that that's that's pretty dramatic. There's like probes on your brain. Um, they turn you on and off. There's a pack, a battery pack that needs to be changed. Um, but for people who really are desperate, um, this is the thing to consider. Okay. So anyway, um, what we think is that up to 50% of people who have received no benefit from SSRIs and ERP, um, up to 50% of people have shown a response to the interventions that I just talked about. Okay, so it is worth considering. Even if you're in pretty good treatment, but you're not getting quite the treatment effect that you want, you should be talking to your therapist about whether or not any of these other <coughs> would be helpful. Okay. Um, one other thing that I just want to talk about that's sort of the new thing in OCD is pandas. Everybody here, here, pandas? Pandas? Okay. So, pediatric autoimmune neuropsychiatric disorder associated with strep. So, prior to like the last couple of years, which was actually really controversial, there was a group of people in the country who really believed that strep was, uh, pandas was real, a group of really motivated parents, and a lot of the professionals who believed it was not real. NAMH did not believe it was real. There were some people within NAMH that believed it was real, but in general, as an institution, NAMH did not believe this was real. Two years ago, well in 2010, so two and a half, three years ago, the International OCD Foundation, who's never really taken a stance on anything, took a stance on this and went to NAMH and said, this is real and we want to change the way you think about this. This is, this is huge. So we, um, we ran a conference with some our people from our scientific advisory board, um, pediatric psychiatrists from our um, scientific advisory board, went to NIMH and talked to people there. And there was like sort of a mini conference to help resolve some of the debates and controversies surrounding pandas. And as a result, NIMH did change their stance. And they wrote what's, wrote what's called the white paper. And you could see that on the NIMH website. But basically, it was written um, with conclusions, with basically the conclusions from the conference in terms of future direction. So a redefining of the criteria and more specific treatment recommendations. But basically, the bottom line is that sometimes kids with strep um, will have an acute onset of OCD, a significant drastic change in functioning within 24 to 72 hour period. And I mean like, your kid is no OCD, your kid is incapacitated with OCD. Wow. Your kid's writing looks one way, your kid's writing looks completely opposite the next day. It is dramatic. Um, there might be an onset of tics or other rapid jerky movements, significant weight loss due to refusal to eat, often because of a fear of choking or throwing up, significant separation anxiety, sudden unexplainable rages, increased sensory sensitivity, closing no, uh, noise, light taste, Noticeable decrease in handwriting, math skills, att and attention resulting in dramatic changes in school performance. This is overnight. This is not over the course of time. This is overnight. And so the reason why we really want to get the word out about the fact that this is real is because if, if, your kid, if this happens to your kid, you need to bring your kid to the pediatrician and you need to have them tested for strep. And if they're strep infection, we recommend that they're treated with antibiotics. A, a two, at least a two-week course of antibiotics because if you can catch it while there's still infection in the body, we think that we can take care of it. Okay, but if you bring, I, I worked with at least two or three um, families where the mothers and fathers knew it was pandas or had a suspicion it was pandas and went to the pediatrician and the pediatrician's like, well, that's not real. That's not real. And so they can't get the antibiotics that they need. We also consulted on a case of a kid with major, what we think to be pandas, at Children's Hospital. Children's Hospital does not believe in pandas. And the wow. parents were really pushing antibiotics, and Children's Hospital ended up calling DSS, DC, uh, DCF at this point, on the parents, and wanting to see the kids better. And so it's a, it's a real problem. So International OCD Foundation is really working with NIMH to get the word out, where we just designed a whole new pediatric outreach program directly targeting pediatricians to help them understand what this is, keep a lookout for it. Now, there are many parents who say, oh, my kid definitely has pandas, and I know they don't have pandas. Okay, so not every kid that has OCD is pandas, but when there's an acute and dramatic overnight change, it could be pandas, go to a pediatrician. I, I, I just consulted with the family uh, on Monday, 
I said, go to your pediatrician. They want to go to children's. No children's. Go to your pediatrician, print out this white paper from the NIMH website, and say, this is what it is. I want you to test for strep. If, you, if, this, if my kid has strep, I want two weeks antibiotics of whatever. Okay, so I'm getting the word out here. Um, you'll, you might hear more about it. We're doing um, public service announcements and a bunch of other things. So, yes, Chris. I just want to ask you, is it, this is, they haven't been treated yet, right? They, 72 hours or 24, 72 hours after they think they have strep, right? There's been no antibiotics yet, right? Okay. No, so if my five-year-old um, from one day to another completely changed and was sick, I mean, if you have strep, yeah. you kind of know you're sick. Yeah. I take the pediatrician, have him tested for strep, and say, I want this kid on antibiotics ASAP. It's, we're still like learning about it. There's almost no real research on it, and we're working on that. We're fundraising for it. We're working on that. Um, the IOCDF, like I said, we had a, we just recently had a conference at Rogers Memorial Hospital over the fall um, because Rogers right now is the only um, residential treatment program for kids. So we felt like it's ground zero. We want to go there and educate the staff and educate uh, the psychiatrists there about what PANDAS is and what to do about it. They also wanted to know what to do about it because lots of families were saying, my kid has pandas and I want you to treat them for pandas. But the bottom line is, at this point anyway, if it's been years and years, your kid may have had pandas, but if it's been years and no one's done anything about it, of course, if antibiotics is not going to take away the OCD. It's still a CBT approach. You still need to do CBT. But if you can get that two to three to four week window where there's still infection in the body and you can get antibiotics in there, we're hoping and thinking that that will have to be improved. Jenny Key has experimented with um, Adults who we thought had pandas as kids, giving them antibiotics later, and I don't think there's really been any change. And a couple people on my case, Lodi's done that with, and there's been no change. So it, it's urgent because we just think we want to catch people in that window. What about if it was pandas as a kid and you get struck as an adult with that form of um, it, it can, yeah, and that's what they say that there's. It's sort of like episodic. It can, it can definitely. Um, spike again if someone has strep. But I don't think, and again, I don't know the answer to this question. If you then treat a later strep infection with antibiotics, if it's going to take care of it. I think it's that initial one. But again, there's still a lot to learn. And mostly at this point, I just want to be letting people know that this is something that we believe in. NAMH ha has changed their stance, but pediatricians in general, it's still very controversial. It's like Lyme disease. Um, and like I said, even children, is not really believing it. So we're trying to figure that out. But anyway. So um, that is the future directions of uh, diagnosis and treatment of OCD. So now we'll get our questions. I, I just want to point out one thing that sure. it must be very hard when people do go to their doctor with a child who exhibits some of those because any child with strep may have many of those anyway. Yeah. So, so what it's we are um, probably hard to advocate to maybe you know, a new thing to a pediatrician. Yeah, but um, we just had strep in our house, mm -hmm. 10 year olds. We just had strep in our house, yeah. 10 year old. But she did not, her handwriting did not change dramatically. And, you know, she did not have major tics or anything like that. So really, I don't know if anybody in here is living with some older pandas, but I think it's it's dramatic, like, overnight. And I think at that point, so it is hard, though, because a lot of times, you know, pediatricians, like I've said three or four times already, um, don't believe in it. So we arm people with the information say this is what but yeah, and it's tricky. It's really tricky. It's really tricky. But do they know 100% that, that it's strep, or could it be the, the body's reaction? To be Something perfectly honest with you, I believe at this point that they've even moved beyond strep. I think it can okay. be infection. Okay. Um, the kid that the mother that I was consulting with on Monday. He had infection after teeth removal, so it wasn't strep, but it was something else. But anyway, so we we're testing okay. for it. Again, I don't have all the answers. We don't have all the answers. We're still trying to figure it out. Um, but this is something. This is a new direction. Yep. You had a slide on dopamine, the antipsychotics. Mm -hmm. Can you clarify whether there are any uh, side effects related to using dopamine drugs in connection with SSRIs? Well, because I'm not an MD, I won't be able to. I just know anecdotally, I mean, there are side effects. I mean, there's sedation, there's weight, increased appetite, so people experience weight gain. So there are there are side effects. Um, but I think as with most med trials, it's really sort of weighing the pros and cons. <clears throat> Is that similar for the glutamates as well? I actually, you know, again, this is all anecdotal. Um, we, because we used it, 
at the OCD Institute, I saw a lot of people on it. I think there were almost no side effects, and that's why Jenna keeps really comfortable having, you know, experimenting with it off label. I didn't. There weren't really any side effects. Thanks. Any other questions? If anyone's interested in learning more about ACT, acceptance and commitment therapy, the happiness trap, I. I recommend that to everybody. I, I recommend it to people in my life who do not have OCD because I think it's a useful way of thinking about running your life, living your life. Go ahead. Uh, just one question I have is on the family piece. Mm -hmm. um, I think that there's an upcoming seminar on yes. family. Yes. Will that be more gone yes. more into Exactly, that? yes. So we have an upcoming one on ACT. We have an upcoming one on family stuff. Um, next year we'll have one on attentional training. And I think we have one on... Um, Skin picking, it's like body focus repetitive. Mm -hmm. Oh, Pandas, yeah, Diane Davies doing Pandas. Um, she did grand rounds at McLean on Pandas, so she's going to come next month. She'll do a whole thing on Pandas. So if you want to learn more about it, come back. Thank you, Denise. Any other questions? Uh, sorry. <laughs> Thanks, Chris. You're welcome. DBT is also mindfulness based. So DBT and ACT are like the third wave of CBT. Okay. Absolutely. It's much more about tolerating how you feel. So most of the times when people feel strongly, it's like right up here on their face. And if your feelings are right here, you can't really interact with the world. You can't really live in the world. And what we want people to do is not get rid of them, but just move them over. You're aware that they're there. They're, I mean, obviously they're unpleasant, but we're tolerating it and we're still living in the world. And if you clarify what is important to you and the kind of life that you want to have and what your values are, and you make decisions based on those, then you will have a rich and meaningful life. If your life is lived, if you're living your life through here, you're screwed, right? I mean, it's just, it's just time, it creates more pain and more discomfort and more problems and not less. It's difficult to do. I mean, because it's hard to tolerate that stuff. It's hard not to believe it. It's hard not to let that be in charge. But when you can, it is... It is clarifying. I find that sometimes uh, talk, maybe it's like about eight years ago. I yeah. Put them on. And after there was a 12 step meeting. For not, anymore. Monday, not anymore. Which, well, it just, the only thing I bring up is yeah. it sounds similar to ACT, but yeah. a different version of. 12 steps. I mean, there is, there is similarities, and 12 steps work, right? Yeah. And did that, so did that never take off with OCD? Did that the Not really. I mean, they, um, there still are OCA meetings around, and at the, at the annual conference that we run, um, we do have an OCA meeting there, but I don't, I don't think so. Not quite in the way others. Mm -hmm. Anything else? Any questions? No, I'm good. I'm about to clap. Forget it. Yeah. Other woman mentioned the DDT and that was also very much a lot of things that uh, for like 15 years lived to the organs and was teaching people who were at the institute. Is that fairly accurate? What was he teaching him? <clears throat> oh, a lot of things about global globalizing and globalizing things. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. I mean, I think it's a general way of thinking. Yeah. It. it when Nate comes and talks about it, it'll. It, it's. It's <coughs> talking about it sort of generally, but there really is a real theory behind it. And there really is a real treatment and real strategies. We're really trying to promote psychological flexibility as a way of reducing pain. I just thought of something. Did, um, do you know of any research or any theories about um, if you have a certain allergy? Whether you have either mental illness or OCD or any anxiety disorder? I don't know. Okay. Well, if there are no more questions, thank you guys for coming. I hope to see you in future lectures. Enjoy this job.